Hello, this is Dr. Morris, and I decided to record these last three lectures. We will still be talking in class, but it gives you an additional way to study. Um, I am at home. My hair is not combed. I am wearing my tie-dye, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's where we're starting from. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about spinal cord injuries and also about low back pain, which is a common complaint in primary care. Um, there are some videos in this presentation. I've watched most of them. I will not add them to this um, video. You can watch them separately from the PowerPoint presentation. So we have a number of topics that we're going to cover um, that relate to spinal cord injuries in addition to the topic of lower back pain. So spinal cord injuries um, are uh, fairly common and present often to the emergency department, um, although occasionally they present in other places like urgent cares and primary cares. The most common cause of spinal cord injuries are motor vehicle collisions, but falls um, and those can often occur as uh, occupationally related injuries. Uh, roofers, people who work on ladders and fall, can sustain spinal cord injuries. And then violence, so assaults um, in, and uh, even assaults with weapons can result in spinal cord injuries. For traumatic spinal cord injuries, the most commonly injured vertebra are C2, um, so very near the top of the spinal column uh, between C5 and 7 and then the lower thoracic vertebra T11 and 12. We're going to review a little bit of the anatomy of the spine and the spinal cord. So you remember that we have 33 bony vertebrae um, and that the spine Basically, you know, the head bone is attached to the backbone and the backbone is attached to the pelvic bone. Um, and, and there is a column there um, to hold us upright uh, and support our weight. So the spine is supported by the pelvis. And there are ligaments between um, vertebra uh, and between the um, spine, the processes of the vertebra, uh, but also there are ligaments that extend the length of the vertebra to help support it and to connect the head to the pelvis essentially along the spine. Um, the most critical of these is the anterior longitudinal ligament which runs down the anterior surface of the vertebral bodies attaching the vertebral bodies uh, together and protecting against hyperextension. Um, so bending backwards in an extreme way, this ligament stabilizes the spine and prevents that. There is also a ligament called the posterior uh, longitudinal ligament that runs down the posterior surface of the vertebral bodies within the spinal canal and in a similar way stabilizes that spinal column to prevent injuries due to hyperflexion by stabilizing the spine to prevent um, over extreme forward flexion. Uh, you also remember that there are um, interspinous ligaments, supraspinous ligaments, um, facet capsule ligaments, um, intertransverse ligaments, and the ligamentum flavum on the posterior uh, surface of the spinal canal. And all of those help to stabilize the structure. Looking at the bones of the spine, we have seven cervical vertebra and eight uh, dermatomes or myotomes related to those vertebra because there are eight um, outlets and spinal nerves, the first between 
the skull in C1 and the lowest between C7 and T1. So that's the C8 um, dermatome myotome. Um, between every vertebra, spinal nerves emerge. Then the seven cervical vertebra uh, with a um, kyph uh, yeah, uh, normal um, lordosis, the thoracic vertebra with a slight kyphosis, um, and the lumbar vertebra with a lordosis again, and then the fused sacral vertebra, there are five of them creating one structure um, by adulthood, and the coccyx, um, which can be up to five tiny vertebra that are fused. The spinal levels go down to um, S5, uh, the fifth sacral, and a coccygeal nerve emerging um, beyond the fifth sacral vertebra. Uh, sorry, the coccyx is up to four fused vertebra. So the cervical spine is intentionally very flexible. It allows for a broad range of movements, um, as you know, flexion, rotation, lateral flexion, and extension. The top joint, uh, C1, which is the first cervical vertebra, sits on C2. Uh, C1 is known as the atlas, and C2 is known as the axis. Um, and has an extension that allows for that lateral movement and rotation. Um, the thoracic spine is pretty rigid. Um, there is a little bit of movement in the thoracic spine, but because of the um, way that the ribs attach to the thoracic spine and all of the musculature that's associated with the thoracic spine and the ribs, um, that area of the spine is relatively uh, rigid and stable. The lumbar spine, again, has not a lot of motion, although it certainly has some. Um, it doesn't have the ribs, so it's a little bit less protected, um, but it has the largest vertebral bodies, and it is very robust because the lumbar spine is where most of the body's weight is carried. And then the sacrum has five fused vertebra that um, attach the spine to the pelvis uh, at the sacroiliac joints. And the coccyx or the tailbone is just a little fused bit of bone um, inferior to the sacrum. So you remember that a, a vertebra has a body um, this is anterior, this is posterior. The posterior portion um, allows for the, or is the uh, anterior wall of the vertebral canal, or the, and includes the vere, vertebral foramen. The vertebra um, decrease, uh, sorry, increase in size from the cervical vertebra, which are relatively small, down to the sacral vertebra. They have a spinous process uh, extending posteriorly, and they have transverse processes extending laterally. Uh, we talked a little bit about the ligaments. Um, again, the vertebral foramen uh, make up the vertebral canal through which the spinal cord runs. And between the vertebral bodies are fibrocartilaginous structures that we call intervertebral discs. So the discs do a couple of things. They are shock absorbers, uh, but they also allow a little bit of flexibility and movement um, so that the vertebra can uh, do a little bit of flexion and extension. And then again, there are those important ligaments, the anterior longitudinal ligament that prevents hyperextension and the posterior longitudinal ligament, which is within the, verte the um, vertebral canal, the spina, um, spinal cord uh, canal, 
and that prevents uh, overflexion, hyperflexion. So the spinal cord runs from um, the foramen magnum uh, down through that spinal canal and ends at about L2, um, beyond which the various spinal nerves for the lower uh, spinal um, levels, um, L3 through uh, S5, um, are separated into the cauda equina uh, or horse's tail and um, emerge between the lower vertebra, but the spinal cord ends at about L2. It is supplied with arterial blood by vertebral arteries and spinal arteries, and it has a pattern of gray matter and white matter. The gray matter uh, being in um, what are called horns um, and including uh, in a sort of a butterfly pattern in the center of the spinal cord um, and made up of nerve cells of cell bodies and then there are is white matter which are these bundles longitudinal bundles of heavily myelinated nerve fibers some of which ascend and some of which descend carrying uh, sensory and motor uh, signals e, um, afferent and efferent signals to and from uh, brain to the periphery or the periphery to the brain. In addition, we, if you remember in, back in physiology, we talked about the autonomic um, spinal cord. The um, parasympathetic nervous uh, system fibers come from the brain stem and the sacrum, um, but emerging in some places uh, with cervical um, uh, fibers and the uh, sympathetic um, cell bodies are in the thoracic and lumbar levels although if you remember they extend out to the spinal chain ganglia which can be higher and lower than that but the cell bodies are in the thoracic and lumbar spinal cords so ascending tracts are by definition sensory. They are conducting um, information from the periphery, from the body to the brain. That information is afferent. It is going in. And there are, um, these are myelinated fibers in white matter. And there are um, two pathways that take information uh, from the periphery to the brain, ending up in the somatosensory cortex. Um, there are uh, receptors um, that bring in data that originates outside the body, um, pain, temperature, and touch. So these are receptors in the skin. Um, but that are detecting uh, stimuli that are from outside the body. And then there are proprioceptive signals that originate from muscles and joints and tendons um, from receptors that detect stretch and position. And these tracts include the spinothalamic tracts, which go from uh, the pr from the spinal cord to the thalamus where if you remember the thalamus is sort of the processing center for sensory information from which it is relayed uh, on to the sensory cortex and to other places and the spinocerebellar tracts um, and then there is something called the posterior column and all of these are white matter. Here is the gray matter in the center. That's that uh, the cell bodies that I talked about. But this is all um, this is all white matter conducting with either afferent or efferent 
uh, fibers. So the and I'm not going to test you in great detail on this stuff, but it is helpful to know. I think you've had it before. I'm hoping that that the repetition helps you to kind of uh, consolidate it and be able to apply it um, ultimately uh, in your clinical practice. We are here talking about ascending afferent pathways, which are blue in this diagram, so you can ignore the red, um, and the lateral spino um tract lateral from the spine to the thalamus um, conducts pain sensation and temperature sensation. And because of how um, the crossover is close to the level at which the spinal nerve comes in, an injury will result in loss of uh, pain sensation, pinprick sensation, or temperature, um, hot or cold stimuli on the contralateral side below the level of injury. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. The anterior spinothalamic tract, which is not so far from that, but is more anterior as opposed to lateral, um, conducts uh, touch and pressure sense, light touch, um, crude touch, uh, and pressure. And if there is an injury to the anterior spinothalamic tract, the patient will have contralateral loss of touch and pressure below the level of the injury, again, because of crossover uh, relatively near the um, point of lesion. The dorsal columns, um, let's go back here. Um, the dorsal columns um, contain something called the gracile fasciculus and the cuneate fasciculus, and they conduct um, discriminative touch, so that ability to de detect uh, very close um, stimuli, but also uh, this other sorts of discrimination data that we talked about and vibratory sense, along with um, our parts of our position sense that are called conscious proprioception, um, and receive input from receptors in joints and muscles and tendons, as well as from the skin, from uh, receptors that are called Pacinian corpuscles and Meissner's corpuscles. You don't have to worry about that a whole lot. In this diagram, we are looking at how the spinothalamic tract um, crosses over close to the level of injury, which is why you will have contralateral loss of sensation um, from the opposite side. The dorsal columns actually cross over um, higher um, and sometimes actually um, in the brain stem. So you may, below the level of spinal injury, uh, lose sensation from the ipsilateral side. And sometimes that difference between loss of pain and temperature and loss of fine touch and proprioception can help you uh, localize the level inj of injury because of retained or lost um, sensation. The descending tracts um, are motor tracts and descend from the motor cortex um, carrying motor information and also from the uh, cerebellum and from um, other uh, nuclei within the brain. And these tracts are classified as pyramidal and extrapyramidal. 
and these fibers, the corticospinal tracts, um, have a lot to do with voluntary fine uh, body motions. Most of those fibers decussate um, in the medulla, um, although a few will carry on and decussate closer. They, they all eventually cross um, to the opposite side. Um, Again, that sometimes can be helpful in locating the level of injury. Although I have to say that in the current era, we are much more likely to use imaging uh, studies to get a much more um, detailed look at the anatomy and therefore a better understanding of the uh, specifics of the injury. Um, there are a number of extra pyramidal tracks. Um, and you don't have to worry about these. They each, each of those tracts um, in those dorsal columns has a specific um, uh, motor function. Not necessarily dorsal columns. But as we talked about the um, spinal thalamic tracts, these have to be ascending, right? Because they're going from the spine to the thalamus. The um, corticospinal tracts are going from the cortex to the spinal column. Okay. So as um, those nerve fibers are um, either ascending or descending, they join into nerves that are called spinal nerves. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves that originate and emerge from the spinal cord. And they carry both afferent and efferent signals. So they, they carry sens sensory signals in and motor signals out, and they're named according to the level of the spine from where they arise, and this is what gives rise to what we call our dermatomes and our myotomes. So there are eight cervical spinal nerves, 12 thoracic spinal nerves, five lumbar spinal nerves, five sacral spinal nerves, and one coccygeal spinal nerve. And this is a diagram of the, uh, of the dermatomes, okay, dermatomes being by definition um, sensory. So I should have changed that slide. I apologize for that. And again, um, finding what dermatomes are involved can give you a sense of where an injury is um, in the spinal cord. Um, this is motor and this would be myotomes and I know you've talked about these um, a lot with uh, Dr. Um, Greer Fisher um, so I, you probably remember them better than I remember them but um, your shoulder shrug um, is C3 and 4, sensation of C3 and 4 is to the top of the shoulder. So this is both motor and sensory. And again, I'm not going to test you in great detail on this, but this is stuff that, that keeping, having a reference and knowing where to go to look it up when you need it can be very helpful. Okay, so what happens when the spinal cord gets injured? Well, an initial injury from that motor vehicle accident or from a fall or from trauma could result in a primary injury, which is what happens at the time of injury, of compression of the cord, of direct cord injury, like um, uh, part crushing, of uh, cutting that interrupts um, the cord, so crushing or cutting would be direct cord injury, um, or a problem with the blood supply of the spinal cord resulting in spinal cord ischemia and therefore uh, 
injury. But after that initial injury, you can have secondary injuries. Um, so because the initial injury may cause bleeding in the area, you can get swelling and swelling can cause further compression and further inflammation and further injury. Um, blood supply problems um, or swelling can result in ischemia. Um, fragments of bone uh, or of other structures but often of bone can end up um, if there is not great care taken in moving the patient in further spinal cord injury that would be secondary injury and the injuries that we see in the spinal cord we classify as um, cord concussion or contusion re which results in a temporary loss of the function of those myelinated nerve fibers in the spinal cord compression and compression may be treatable by decompression by surgery to release the pressure um, to either prevent or minimize permanent injury laceration uh, or a direct cutting of the spinal cord and and at this time that results in permanent injury if those axons are severed they do not repair um, so it depends on the degree of the damage but if the spinal cord is lacerated in general that results in permanent damage and then hemorrhage bleeding and the bleeding can cause lead to inflammation it can lead to compression and it may result in local ischemia and even infarction um, so you may have temporary or permanent damage depending on the degree of injury one kind of spinal cord injury is spinal cord transection um, and this would be a laceration or a tear uh, resulting in a complete disruption of all of the tracts that would be sensory and motor and any functions that were mediated by the spinal cord below that level and again sensory and motor are going to be permanently lost um, because that um, concussion injury can result in temporary loss of function we typically don't make this diagnosis until at least 24 hours have passed after the injury um, but it may result in um, uh, paraplegia or quadriplegia it's not going to result in hemiplegia because um, if the entire spinal cord is transected it's not going to involve only one side it will involve um, upper extremities or upper extremities and lower extremities so paraplegia or quadriplegia there are several incomplete lesions of the spinal cord that have names um, and these may be damage or transection um, uh, that results in um, uh, spinal cord injury creating certain specific um, syndromes so there's something called brown saccard syndrome anterior cord syndrome this is brown saccard which is a half a hemi uh, cord injury uh, anterior cord syndrome where only the front of the spinal cord is involved and central cord syndrome where the center of the spinal cord is involved in brown saccard syndrome you get a hemisection so suppose there's a partial transection um, from a penetrating injury or from a vertebral dislocation all of the tracts motor and um, sensory on the affected side are um, are affected um, for motor function because most of those fibers decussate in the medulla you'll have ipsilateral loss of motor function along with uh, ipsilateral loss of position vibration and light touch sensation but you'll have contralateral loss of sensation 
uh, to pinprick, to pain, and to temperature. And bowel and bladder dysfunction are pretty common with brown Saccard syndrome. And you have an osmosis video. I didn't actually watch this one, but I'm sure it's good. In anterior cord syndrome, this is typically caused when there's either a disruption of the anterior spinal artery by um, pressure or by injury from bony fragments. So the anterior spinal artery supplies the front two-thirds of the spinal cord to the upper thoracic region. And we have variable clinical findings associated with anterior cord syndrome. Um, but typically, there'll be a variable loss of motor function um, and sensation, and propri uh, but proprioception and vibratory uh, sensation are preserved because those um, columns are not uh, supplied by the anterior um, spinal artery. In central cord syndrome, which usually occurs with hyperextension of the cervical region, we get an interesting um, pattern in which there's weakness or paralysis in the upper extremities, but no lower extremity involvement, possible bladder dysfunction, um, and um, s often some incomplete loss of truncal motor function. So in transection below uh, the cervical level, you would have paralysis of the lower extremities with preservation of the upper extremity strength. In central cord syndrome, you have the opposite. You have loss of strength of motor function in the upper extremities with preserved motor function in the lower extremities. So that's an interesting syndrome. Now I mentioned the cauda equina, which are those spinal nerves within the spinal canal below the level of L2. Um, and cauda equina syndrome describes injury to the cauda equina, usually occurring with spinal fractures below uh, the L2 level. And the level, it, uh, the dysfunction that occurs is going to depend on which um, nerves are involved. Uh, you can get flaccid paralysis of the lower extremities. Very common to get um, involvement of bowel and bladder function um, and sexual function. And again, I did not watch this video, but I'm sure it's very good. Now, sometimes when the spinal cord um, undergoes trauma, we get something called neurogenic shock. And neurogenic shock is basically a spinal cord shock. It is not necessarily from transection or from an injury that's going to create a permanent primary spinal cord injury. But there is a temporary loss of autonomic, autonomic function of the cord at the level of injury. Um, usually resulting from injury in the cervical or, or high thoracic area. Um, and the effects may be temporary, um, they usually resolve, and our goal, as with really all spinal cord injuries, is to stabilize and try to avoid secondary injury. So sometimes these folks may present with flaccid paralysis distal to the injury site that looks like it's going to be permanent. But they also have loss of autonomic function, and they'll have problems with blood pressure, with bowel and bladder control, um, with thermoregulation, um, and even with uh, cardiac rate. Um, when people have injuries above um, T6, um, so uh, spinal cord injuries above T6 um, with autonomic involvement, they may get a um, 
syndrome that is that is potentially life-threatening that's considered a medical emergency that's caused autonomic hyperreflexia syndrome and again autonomic uh, functions are just out of control so it's overstimulated you'll have very high blood pressure bad headaches sweating flushing anxiety um, maybe a bradycardia so how do we manage spinal cord injuries well I, you've talked about this in emergency medicine um, basically you pay attention to those ABCs airway breathing circulation make sure the patient is stabilized but you also stabilize their spinal cord so anybody with a suspected spinal cord injury or a mechanism which suggests the high likelihood of spinal cord injury should be stabilized with a cervical collar and a backboard um, until x-rays are done and the level of instability is determined so, um, so this person will be examined in the emergency room to determine if they have sensory or motor um, deficits and they will have a at least cervical uh, x-ray to make sure that they don't have cervical instability and further imaging as indicated may or may not need labs this is all dependent on the um, presentation the, the mechanism like what happened what are the current symptoms and physical findings um, and um, what do we think is going on certainly in the case of trauma we're almost always going to get a CBC we're going to look at uh, organ function with a CMP we're going to get um, clotting studies PT and PTT to make sure that the person is not at risk of excessive bleeding you might get a sed rate or a CRP I think that's a little bit less likely imaging certainly spine films often a chest x-ray and then further imaging as uh, is thought to be needed remembering that CT scans are x-rays uh, and therefore um, are good for looking at bony structures and MR um, is much better at looking at relative densities of tissues so it's better at looking for cord injuries uh, directly and um, uh, soft tissue so that's spinal trauma in a nutshell I want to talk a little bit about back pain, particularly lower back pain, although neck pain is another problem that you'll see. Um, low back pain is the most common cause of disability in younger uh, people in our society and is associated with enormous health care costs and a big burden for primary care providers because it's the second most common cause for primary care visits, if you can imagine that most people with low back pain um, get better um, and in fact about 90 percent of episodes resolve in six weeks most of them sooner than that 80 percent in two weeks um, I believe this is a video uh, that I didn't watch um, but talks a little bit about the causes um, and the treatment of lower back pain I'm not going to play it because I'm not sure the sound would record appropriately. Okay. Um, a lot of times people talk about low back pain as sciatica. Sciatica is a specific type of low back pain with radiation of pain from the back down the leg in a sciatic nerve distribution. Um, and we'll talk about tests that we do looking for sciatica I do want you to be aware that the vast majority of cases of low back pain um, whatever evaluation is done and you know you can do no imaging you can do plain films you can do CTs and MRIs 
but most of the time there's very low yield, especially if there's not specific trauma or specific physical findings. So most cases of low back pain, we don't really know where the pain is coming from. We don't get a specific causal diagnosis. And if you think about the complexity of the back, there are muscles, there are tendons, there are ligaments, there are bones, there are neural structures. Any of those can can cause their joints, lots of joints, and, and dysfunction in any of those may result in pain. Most of them are not related to the spinal cord, to spinal nerves. Um, so we just usually don't know. And in, because we don't know, if there's not a good reason to image, we usually don't need to image. There are risk factors for um, lower back pain. People who have occupational um, exposures that include repetitive lifting or straining, um, chronic exposure to vibration, to machinery, you know, sitting in a forklift, um, those things make them more prone to low back pain of the sort that is difficult to diagnose the cause. Um, people with osteoporosis are prone to low back pain, in which case we may find the cause because osteoporosis may result in uh, compression fractures, which um, may be very minor to very major, but can cause pain. And people who are older are more likely to get back pain than people who are younger. The etiology of low back pain includes all of these things and other things that we maybe don't understand very much. Uh, but sometimes low back pain is a result of tumor. A, a um, common um, cause of severe low back pain in older men is metastatic prostate cancer. Prostate cancer often metastasizes to the spine and um, may present as at first just sort of minor nagging back pain which, which progresses. Uh, so tumor, um, disc problems, which we'll talk a little bit more about, um, problems with bursas, problems with joints, the facet joints can develop osteoarthritis and degenerative joint disease, um, mobility issues, infection with inflammation, um, fractures, including compression fractures from osteoporosis, and then tendon and ligament strains from over uh, use or overstretching. Um, degenerative disc disease, those shock absorbers, the fibrocartilaginous intervertebral discs, degenerate with age. Um, and after about the age of 50, this is pretty common, almost universal, although not everybody has pain with their degenerative disc disease. But the, the discs narrow. Uh, if you look at their um, spinal x-rays, they don't look as thick and juicy and cushy as they do in young people. And it's because of um, aging degeneration with, with alterations of the biochemistry of the disc. Degenerative disc disease can lead to disc herniations in which that fibrous capsule, which is kind of leathery, um, degenerates, may tear, and the internal um, gel-like substance of the inside of the disc may protrude. Um, this can happen with trauma. It can happen because of degenerative disc disease. It can happen from improper uh, lifting, which is why um, people who, who lift heavy weights all the time uh, are taught to lift in ways that protect the discs. And here we have two vertebra. We have a nice, healthy intervertebral disc, which leaves the uh, foramen wide open for the spinal nerve to uh, exit. In somebody with a herniated disc, um, perhaps because of degenerative disc disease, perhaps because of trauma, you can have a protrusion of that jelly interior of the disc um, 
that both um, narrows this intervertebral distance, but also may directly um, impact, protrude, compress the emerging spinal nerve. And that can cause pain and it can cause focal neurologic uh, disability. There are stages of disc herniation, um, degeneration, prolapse, extrusion, and sequestration. So sometimes in people with bad um, degenerative disc disease, on their MRI you can actually see fragments of uh, disc um, material in the um, vertebral column that may be any of these uh, after prolapse can start to cause uh, an impact on the spinal cord from compression. So in degeneration, the um, fibrous exterior is weakened, but there's no herniation. In prolapse, there's a bulge, and that bulge can cause, um, as I said, um, compression of the spinal nerve. You can have the nucleus pulposus, that gel-like interior material, breaking through the leathery fibrous annulus fibrosis, but, but staying attached to the disc. Or you can have what's called sequestration, in which case bits break off and may actually um, be, it says outside the spinal canal, but outside of, of the disc, um, potentially into the spinal canal if it's um, posterior here. So here we have um, between S, uh, L5 and S1 a rather severe um, herniation that is compressing the nerve in the intervertebral foramen. Um, and again, this can cause um, focal neurologic signs. Uh, you can see some narrowing of the disc. You can see some mild protrusions higher up. Those protrusions are um, pushing on the spinal cord. This one is actually pushing very hard on the spinal cord. And in addition to compressing the nerve in the intervertebral foramen, uh, on this image, it's compressing the spinal cord itself. And this is a description of, of that specific um, condition we call sciatica, uh, which is a um, sub uh, category of lower back pain and may often result from disc injuries. When we suspect sciatica, we do something called the straight leg raise. We talked about this in um, HNP2, uh, where you have your patient um, supine um, and raise one leg to see if it reproduces their symptoms. Um, and you pay attention to what um, degree of hip flexion results in uh, reproduction of that radiating pain. Now, I think this may be the last thing in this lecture. There are red flags for low back pain that should make you be concerned about the potential that that back pain is um, pathological, is not one of those typical idiopathic uh, causes of back pain that's likely to get better. Um, and these are, it says nine, but there are a whole bunch more of them, right? So let's, um, let's go through them. You know, if you see somebody with back pain who is also complaining of unexplained weight loss, you need to start to think about things like cancer, but also spinal TB, uh, which is certainly not very common anymore, something that used to be quite common. Um, but if you're in, uh, wor depending on where you're working, if TB is endemic, it's something to think about, particularly if you have an immunocompromised uh, patient. Night pain um, also is suggestive of, of potentially cancer pain. If the back pain is worse, when they're resting than it is when they're active. That should make you think about imaging. 
and about potential more serious causes of the pain. Anybody with a history of cancer who presents with back pain that's persistent, you want to look a little closer. And older people over 50, over 70, you want to think about the possibility of pathology. Fever and night sweats, again, make you think cancer or might make you think um, TB. And um, bone TB, uh, spinal TB, as I said, used to be quite common and it still happens. So it's something to think about. And then people with recent infections, um, injection drug users who are prone to weird and serious infections. And then a, f a couple of symptoms, um, folks with uh, saddle anesthesia. So that's uh, numbness, paresthesias on the inside of the thighs and in the pelvic area, or who have problems with urinary incontinence or retention, or who have undergone trauma of a sort that puts them at risk for spinal injury or who have physical signs of trauma that suggest um, potential underlying injury. Um, so pay attention to these things um, uh, and image when and f argue for imaging when you think there's a possibility of severe of pathological back pain and and really most people with back pain you don't have to image when you unless they don't get better and if they don't get better then you image um, if you have somebody who has a relatively new onset of back pain and you think there's a red flag there's a good chance that if you want an MRI, you're going to have to get on the phone with some clerk and go through what red flags you see and why you think that imaging is important. When you do the neuro exam, you want to pay attention especially to um, deep tendon reflexes, to muscle weakness, um, and to things like uh, whether a Babinski uh, sign is present. Um, hyperreflexia suggests upper motor neuron injury. Hyporeflexia or loss of reflex suggests lower motor neuron injury. And then um, loss of sphincter tone. So somebody who has a um, severe injury with a potential spinal cord injury, uh, you do a rectal exam and you pay attention to anal sphincter tone um, and to anal sensation. If they don't feel your finger protruding and you don't feel their anus squeezing, um, that is worrisome. I get, that's obviously a physical exam, uh, exam sign, a neuro exam. But you also want to pay attention to just look at your patient. If they can't walk or if they're uncomfortable sitting, if they're grimacing when they move, if their um, posture is all out of whack because they have muscle spasm and you can often feel the muscle in spasm, um, if they are very tender, particularly to, uh, localized tenderness when you lightly percuss over the spinous process, may suggest um, vertebral injury, spinal injury. And then it, uh, pain in the chest or abdomen, along, uh, uh, particularly in the setting of trauma. And also in the setting of potential cardiovascular disease, right? You want to know about chest pain and abdominal pain associated with back pain because aneurysms um, can present with back pain. And then again, um, when do you image? If you think there might be a fracture, you image. Whenever there's major trauma, you image. Relatively minor trauma in older patients, it's important to image. People who've been on steroids for a long time get osteoporosis and need to be imaged. Um, anybody over 70 with severe back pain, you probably want to image. 
um, if you suspect tumor or infection, you're going to do more labs, right, and potentially imaging. And these are um, the, you know, older people, very young people, you know, it's unusual for children to come in with back pain. Um, so it's something to, to get a little bit more thoughtful about along with older people. Anybody with those constitutional symptoms, the night sweats, the fever, the weight loss, um, people who are at risk for infection like the immunocompromised, people who have recently had bacterial infections, uh, injection drug users, and then people with nocturnal pain. Your SED rate and CRP are going to be helpful in those people with um, potential infection, potential inflammation, potential collagen vascular disease. Um, your analysis can be helpful because sometimes uh, kidney pain presents as back pain. Pregnancy in women of childbearing uh, age always And to treat back pain, you know, we used to put people to bed. We don't do that anymore. In fact, putting people to bed and bed rest uh, makes it take longer to get better. But we do have them restrict or modify their activity in ways to prevent making the back pain worse. Um, stretching and uh, minor exercise can be helpful. Um, Analgesics like NSAIDs and Tylenol can be helpful. Sometimes we use muscle relaxers, which I don't think there's a lot of evidence for, but people find them helpful, especially at night. Um, steroids are occasionally helpful, particularly in people who have um, a degenerative disc disease where perhaps there's a disc bulge with inflammation and by reducing the swelling with a short taper of steroids we may relieve their pain and opioids if if there's an acute injury um, but but again be careful about using opioids chronically there is a set of exercises called McKenzie exercises and there's a video after this that you can look at um, that are helpful for a lot of people to help them reduce pain. And use your physical therapy consultants. PTs are really helpful in, in folks with back pain. Um, I will say that I have found physical therapists I won't refer to anymore because they're a little too hard on some of my patients. Um, you don't want, if, if somebody comes back from the physical therapist and says they're pushing me and I'm just getting worse, just find a different physical therapist. But in general, PTs can be really helpful for folks with back pain to help them strengthen muscles, get back in condition, learn better techniques for uh, doing the things that they need to do without making their pain worse. And this is the video of the McKenzie exercises. Or maybe it's not a video. Maybe it's just, yeah, it's a video. Okay. Some people with back pain need um, surgery. And there are a lot of different potential procedures. Um, discectomy is one potential procedure where the a disc is actually removed. This is particularly done for cervical um, problems. Sometimes the discs are replaced with artificial discs. Laminectomies involve removing um, uh, the lamina to increase the um, opening of the uh, vertebral foramen through which the spinal nerve protrudes which takes the pressure off the foramen. Um, I will say something that's missing here and that I should have added a slide for is pain management because a lot of folks who have these disc problems um, and also people with things like um, uh, arthritis of the facet joints respond very well to pain management 
and local injections. So the pain management doctor will localize the site of the pain, uh, often do a test where they inject a little local anesthetic, and if that relieves the pain, then periodically, maybe every few months, they'll bring the pa the patient in for an injection of local anesthetic and steroid. Um, which uh, reduces inflammation and gives the patient extended pain relief. So remember pain management along with PT for your folks who have persistent um, back pain. And that's it. I hope that was helpful and we'll see you in class.